Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the Discovery Showcase stage, Dr. Oliver Ludwig, Associate Member of the Hackensack Meridian Health Center for Discovery and Innovation. Uh, hi, um, thanks uh, for the invitation. Thanks for the opportunity to share some of the work uh, that we are conducting at the Center for Discovery and Innovation, a member of the Hackensack Meridian Health Network. Um, so. Uh, today, we're going to try to take a different approach uh, in uh, looking at lung cancer, but we also focused on lung diseases. Um, quick uh, disclosure on a company that um, we are very lucky to have been able to form at uh, the CDI to develop some of the technology uh, that we uh, put together there. Um, so lung cancer. It's considered a silent killer. Um, and in the United States, in uh, 2023, it killed about 127,000 people. And another 238,000 were diagnosed that same year. It's the number one uh, cause of cancer death in the United States and actually worldwide. Um, as of today, it expected that people have a 28% survival. Uh, 28% survival at five years, um, and why is that? Uh, because, um, obviously, lung cancer is related to smoking, and only 5% five, five to 6% of people who are at high risk because they smoke get screened yearly. Um, another thing that makes uh, this a silent killer is that uh, there are no real symptoms, um, and they're non-specific when they're there. Uh, whereas ambiguous disease, uh, which appears late, uh, always comes with poor outcome. Um, so what are detection methods? Detection methods are based on imaging, CT, and then after that, it's going to be either biopsy or uh, watchful surveillance if there is no real consensus on the type of uh, lesion that may be in the lung. Uh, there are some existing tests, serum, sputum, uh, nasal swabs, but none of these tests are really good enough to detect lung cancer early. Um, so can we beat lung cancer? I mean, I think we've learned that with breast cancer, women are very active and it has changed uh, the detection and uh, the outcome. So yes, by detecting it early. In fact, 90% of people will survive after five years if it detected early. So there is an urgent need uh, for early detection assays. So, we decided to look at exhaled breath. Um, that's something that is very variable, not just something that happens every few seconds, uh, but it's allowing us to connect the lung with the exterior environment, and it gives us access to the lung without actually uh, touching it. Um, so when you breathe, you have about a thousand chemicals uh, or compounds that you will exhale. Uh, there's two types of compounds. The volatile organic compounds that are mostly gases that are exchanged through your bloodstream. Um, and you have something called non-volatile organic compounds. Um, and so that's what we're going to concentrate on in this presentation. Um, so you all seen this, right? Uh, as kids, you know that from early age, when you breathe on a piece of glass, you form um, the position of moisture, right? Um, so as it turns out, when you breathe, you exhale water droplets. Those water droplets are generally one, two, three micron in size. Um, you also exhale micromolecules. Um, and as you all know, you exhale viral particles. We all learned that with COVID. Um, and something else something called extracellular vesicles. Um, so what are extracellular vesicles? Here, you have a nice video of how they are formed. Um, so those uh, tiny particles are formed by all cells. They are used as a mean to communicate. And if you could see on the top, you could see that the shedding from the membrane of cells. Um, what's interesting is that those are not just empty those little particles, nanoparticles, which allow cells to communicate, 
transport information, RNA, DNA, protein. They have protein on their surface that allow them to uh, transduce signals. So they do a plethora of actions. Uh, they are responsible for homeostasis of organs, uh, organs between themselves, because they circulate. They, get, they are found in all biofluids. They're found in blood, urine, saliva, etc. Um, so we are focused on the analysis of these nanoparticles. Um, here is a size comparison, so you know, you have an idea of what it is we're dealing with. So on the right, you have a cell, and on the extreme left, you have a virus. And you can see that extracellular vesicles are about the size of a virus, between 30, 50, and 150 nanometer. So they're fairly small. And here is a, a cut of an extracellular vesicle, right? So you have, like I said, you have RNA, DNA, proteins, cargoes inside. Um, you could see also uh, in light purple, the membrane, which is the membrane from the cell they originate from. So if you have a cell that comes from the liver and a cell that comes from the kidney, it will have a membrane originating from the tissue that it's coming from, meaning that it will have unique proteins, unique uh, signatures based on where they're coming from. Um, and I'm going to call them EVs, okay? Extracellular vehicle EVs. And I know it sounds like electric vehicles, but it's called EVs. Um, so these uh, tiny vesicles also have been described as exosomes, maybe something people have heard more often. Um, on their outside, they have proteins uh, that are exposed, the trespanins, CD63, CD9, CD81. So those are proteins that allow us to recognize that uh, these are EVs and not viral particles or other particles. So we have means to recognize them, but we also have on the surface proteins that are originating from the cells they've been produced from. Um, so I'm going to give you an idea of their size compared to a aerosolized water droplet. Um, so if you have a droplet of one micron and a particle of 100 nanometer, you have, uh, this is about the size or something like this. It's about the size of a pea inside an orange. So you could see that when you have tiny water particles, uh, uh, droplet particles in the air, you have a possibility to have these vesicles um, inside of it. And this is what uh, we found. Um, so how do we isolate them? So because they're very small, you need to use ultra centrifugation, which is a technique that uh, makes you spin those tubes at 100,000 RPM or even more, um, so you can pellet them, so you can separate them from the bifluids you study. Um, we've developed a technology that's kind of like an ELISA uh, that allows us to customize the antibodies we want to use to isolate them from biofluids. Here you have an anti-CD9, CD63, CD81, so you can pull them out of biofluids so you can enrich them before you study them. Um, here is a technique to detect them. Uh, this is pulse sensing where you have a, a tiny port where these particles are passed through and changes in charges allow you to detect the size and the number, so you can count them and figure out how much you have in each biofluid. Here is an electron microscopy picture, and you can see it looks like a uh, deflated uh, soccer ball or even a raisin, right, dry raisin. Um, but that's, that's what it looks like, and that's what you find in the circulation. You find that in all biofluids that are produced, contain these EVs because all cells produce them. So they constantly exchange them and they circulate. And here is an image, it's called nanoimaging, where basically that white circle is an area where an EV has been immobilized and you use antibodies that are labeled with fluorescence. And here we're gonna use antibodies against CD63, CD9, and CD81 with three different colors. And once they are immobilized, we can see and count the number of dots that are particular to the proteins that are on the surface of these EVs. So you can detect those known proteins, but then it allows you also, if you choose a different antibody, to detect the protein that you're interested in that probably is present or is present on the typical type of cells and that's gonna be present on the EV. Um, so how do we collect exhaled breath? Um, 
So here we have a device. It's a disposable device. It's very simple. Uh, there's multiple type of devices that have been used, but this one is actually practical because it's one-time use um, and uh, it's, it's fairly easy uh, to use in clinical settings. Um, so you have a polypropylene tube uh, with a mouthpiece and then on top of it you put a cylinder that you keep frozen. And so just like an air conditioning system, when you exhale air, and because the air that you exhale is moist, uh, you're gonna form little droplets on the surface of the tube. And then with a piston, you're gonna push these uh, droplets into the top of the tube. And then as you can see with the tip of the pipette there, you can actually collect a decent amount of biofluid. We generate, um, let's say within 10 minutes, we can get up to two milliliter, which is the equivalent of, uh, a, I would say one fifth of a blood tube. So it's, it's a decent amount just within a matter of minutes. Um, so if we think about uh, the lung itself, uh, the structure, and you have in the background of this uh, slide, you could see those grape-like structures. Uh, so those are uh, the alveoli, and you see the bronch bronchioles that go to them. And on the top of the, the image, you see a, a cut of the bronchial and the alveoli with the different type of cells. So you have different type of cells that line the lung, and each of them is gonna produce EVs. Um, so studies have found that um, two type of cells, club cells, alveolar type two cells, can be associated with the initiation of lung cancer. So, it gives you a cellular origin, and if you learn about these cells, maybe you can find biomarkers that are present on the surface of these cells that will be acquired by the EVs that they produce, and then you can potentially go fish for these EVs in the biofluid of your interest, which here is um, exhaled breath condensate, EBC. Um, and it's basically, you have a bucket of marbles, the marbles being the EVs that are produced by all these different types of cells, but if you have an assay with an antibody that allows you to recognize a protein specific to a type of cell, you go in that bucket and you pick the one you want. And so you can study it because, like I said, you have RNA, DNA proteins, so you can screen it for biomarkers. And so this is what we did. Um, it's still very early, and uh, we have a, a very large effort uh, with different institutions within HMH uh, that are contributing to the collection of exhaled breath from patients that are treatment naive, so we can see if we can detect the disease at its early phase. Uh, but here is a study of uh, a small group of patients where um, you could see from left to right uh, throughout the circle. Um, so you have sample collection, um, you have isolation, and then here you see antibody one and antibody two. So antibody one targets uh, EVs coming from uh, club cells, and antibody two targets EVs com coming from alveolar cells. And uh, we are actually isolating these EVs from the biofluid, which is EBC. And uh, you could see on the top now, in the uh, image on the left, uh, the two images that are superposed, uh, you have EVs, so you can actually confirm that you have those tiny little vesicles that you are exhaling when you breathe. Uh, and then in the nano-imaging images, we could see the markers uh, verifying that the protein we're interested to use to isolate those EVs are there. Um, so what we've been doing for years is uh, next-generation sequencing. Um, so basically, we isolate these EVs, we separate them from the pool they're coming from, we clean them up, we release them, and then we open them, and then we study the content because the content of an EV, if it's coming from a normal cell, will be different than the content from a cell, if it's a cancer cell. So, and that's what we did here on the graph uh, at the bottom uh, right. Uh, you could see if you pull EVs directly out of exhaled breath without selecting them, just globally, you, could, you can see a difference between control and cases, cases being in red. But now, if you actually go and pull EVs knowing the cellular origin, you can see that you have a greater difference, so you have the potential to enrich the population of EVs in EVs that may be cancerous and find biomarkers that are specific to your cancer. 
Um, so this was done on clinical specimens, but we also had a preclinical um, study on mice. Um, so on the bottom uh, left, you could see, um, I don't know if you can see it, but it says mouse tail, uh, where basically we use cells uh, that are cells that will colonize the lung when you inject them in the circulation of the mice. They will home in the lung. And that's what you could see in these animals that are uh, on their back. They are asleep, anesthetized, uh, for you to detect um, fluorescent markers or bioluminescent markers that are inside those cells, and you can scan them. So you could see that within about six weeks, you see a little bit of signal in the thoracic area, and within 12 weeks, all the animals have this signal, meaning that they're all developing lung tumors. Um, so we came up with a device that allows us to collect exhaled breath from mice, and uh, we studied it. We used an antibody. This time, we don't need to be that specific in the cellular origin because we have human tumors growing in mouse. So if we use antibodies that recognize human protein, here is a CD63, we can actually pull EVs that are human from the mouse exhaled breath. And we can recognize it. We could see uh, an electromicroscopy picture of one. And then under, we could see HCD9, HCD81, HCD63, which means human. So we recognize human protein in the exhaled breath of mice that are on the surface of EVs that are from tumor origin. And then we open them and we screen their content. And you can see here, it, those are small RNAs, but we could see, and I highlighted two genes, gene one and two, and you could see in red, uh, this is a heat map profile of expression, yellow being expressed and uh, black being not expressed. So you have red versus blue, control versus cancer. And you can see that there's a lot of genes that appear that shouldn't be there or that are not there in the control. And then we chose gene one and gene two because they've been associated with this type of cancer cells. And we can do PCR, and within one to two weeks, we can detect the lung tumors by exhaled breath analysis uh, without scanning or without doing anything to the animals. Um, and if you remember the image of the animals laying on their back there, we can only start seeing these tumors growing uh, by bioluminescence uh, starting around five to six weeks. So it gives us uh, a, a pretty good advantage for detecting the disease. Um, so the applications, uh, there's a lot of potential applications, uh, obviously lung cancer, uh, but like I said, this is a very, uh, it's a very big uh, task for us to collect sufficient samples to represent the different type of cancers, uh, to analyze and to make sense of it and identify biomarkers for all the different type of cancer at different stages. So that's, that's what we are doing right now. Um, but there are other type of lung diseases that are also uh, associated with poor outcomes that uh, will also be benefiting from a potential non-invasive collection, you know. Um, and so th we're working on this too. So here are all the people that have contributed to this work over the years, and thank you for your time. <laughs>